Thomas Aquinas summarized them nicely in his famous five ways for proving the existence of God. The first one is the argument from motion, or rather change. Not just motion in space, but any kind of change. The one feature that we find everywhere in the universe is change. Nothing stays the same, even the stars grow old. Change is the movement from a state of potentiality to a state of actuality. Something has to have a potential for change. Unless there's kinetic energy in something, you can't generate heat out of it. And some things have potential for one thing, and some things have potential for another thing. Water can make you wet, fire can make you hot, not vice versa. Nothing can change itself, because nothing can actualize itself without being, first of all, actual. You can't give what you don't have. That's the basic principle of causality. There can't be more in the effect than in the cause. That's a basic principle of all commonsensical and scientific explanation. Let me just go through that because that's a, a, an assumption of every proof. Suppose you saw a large purple rabbit suddenly appear on this desk. Would you say, oh well, rabbits happen? No. It had to have a cause. What was the cause? Well, there's no apparent cause. We're not out on the field and rabbits aren't usually very large and purple. Uh, so you might look for a hole in the ceiling that fell down, or a hole in the floor that it came up, or maybe it's not a real rabbit, maybe it's a balloon, maybe I'm a stage magician, maybe I had it up my sleeve. So you do some investigations to find the cause, assuming that there is a cause. And if there's no physical cause possible, then you go to a mental cause. It's not a real rabbit, it's a hallucination, it's a dream, he's hypnotizing me. And if there's no physical cause and no mental cause, you don't then say, oh, well, rabbits happen. Then you look for a supernatural cause. Even a miracle doesn't violate the principle of causality. If only God could create a, an enormous purple rabbit, well, then God must have created an enormous purple rabbit. But even God can't violate the principle of causality. So you can't have more in the effect than in the cause. But Everything changes something else, and therefore it has the power to change that something else, like a row of dominoes. Uh, now, is there anything else than that series of changing things that we call the universe? Is there an eternal being that is uncaused, that is not brought into existence by something else, that doesn't have the transition from potentiality to actuality, but is eternally and timelessly actual? If so, that being would be God. Well, this argument tries to show that there is such a being by showing that if there isn't this uncaused cause, this first, absolutely first cause, then there couldn't be caused causes. Because no matter how many beings there are in this chain, no matter how, how many dominoes there are in the chain, uh, there's gotta be a first domino. Otherwise, the chain doesn't move because Motion goes in one direction, but not in the other. You can't just take it for granted. You can't just say motion happens. Something causes it. No first cause, no second cause. There are second causes, therefore there must be a first cause. A second argument, which makes it even clearer, doesn't just talk about change, but existence. Existence is a gift that is given from some things to other things, like parents to children, or writers to books. We don't create out of nothing, we create out of something, but we create new things. We make things to exist that didn't used to exist. All right. Now, imagine that existence is like a, a, a gift passed down the chain, which it is throughout nature, and you've got it. All right, what does that mean about God? Well, either there is a being that has existence eternally by his own nature and doesn't have a cause of existence, or there isn't. Either the child's question, if God created everything who created God, is a silly question because the answer is nobody, that's what God means, or that's a meaningful question, everything has to have a cause, even God. But if there is no such being that has existence by his own very nature, then how did you ever get it? Suppose I say there's a book that I have the ability to give you, 
And if you get that book, I guarantee you will get a straight A in every single course in college. That book will, will, will give you all the answers to all the puzzles you will ever have in any course. Now, suppose you believe that there is such a book, all right? Professor, would you please give me that book? Well, yes, I will, but I first have to borrow it. Uh, oh, you don't have it? Well, no, I have to get it from my wife. Oh, well, she has it then. No, she has to get it from the library. Oh, they have it then. Well, no, they have to get it from interlibrary loan. So some other library has it. Well, no, nobody has it. Well, if nobody has it, then you're not going to get it. Well, imagine that book is existence. You got it. You received it as a gift. Therefore, somebody has the power to give it, and they must possess it. But if everybody has it on loan and can only pass it on, and nobody has it to begin with, well, then we don't get it. But we do get it. Therefore, somebody must have it eternally, and that's the God whose essence is existence, whose very nature eternally is to be. A third version of almost the same argument is called the argument from contingency and necessity. And frankly, I'm not sure that this one quite works. I think it does, but I'm not sure. So I'm not going to push this too much. Uh, Aquinas argues this way. If there's no God, then there's no creator, and then there's no moment of creation, and then the universe is eternal. The universe had no beginning. Now, this was seven centuries before Big Bang cosmology, and until Big Bang cosmology in the late 20th century, all atheists believed in the eternal universe theory the steady state theory. And they rejected the idea of the Big Bang at first because they thought that was camouflage theism. They thought, quite reasonably, if there's a Big Bang, there's got to be a Big Banger. So that's God. <laughs> but put that aside for a moment and just look at the steady state theory. The universe is there. It always was there. It always will be there. It's the sum total of all things. There's nothing else. Okay. In that case, since there's no beginning, there has already been an infinite amount of time in the universe. So what? Well, from that beginning point, some philosophers argue that you couldn't have reached today if there's an infinite amount of time because you can't go through an infinite amount of, of moments of time uh, and actually reach today if you have to go first through an infinite amount of days or hours or whatever units of time in the past. I don't think that works. That's the fallacy of, of Achilles and the Tortoise by Zeno, the ancient Greek philosopher. But Aquinas doesn't use that version. He uses another version. He says, if there's already been an infinite amount of time, then there's enough time for every possibility to have become actualized. All right? Now, if there's no God, then Every other being than God can not be. There's no being that has to be, necessarily. Everything can cease to be. Everything can die. Well, if there's enough time for everything to die, why is everything, anything still alive? If given infinite time, every possibility is actualized, then at some time in that infinite time, everything in the universe will cease to be. And once nothing exists, nothing can start up again. So how come we're here? 